Hey, welcome to Behind the Scenes on Everything Everywhere All at Once. We're here um, cu uh, just scratching paper with some scissors and then photographing it with an iPhone, and that's how you make a movie. Um, I hope this has been informative. Uh, I learned this not in film school. I mean, I was like a like a giddy schoolboy, to be honest, when they brought it to me because it. They said it wants to be Matrix esque. It's going to be featuring a Chinese family. I was I was already sold from the jump. I wasn't scared by how crazy it was going to be. I was very stoked to do it. All right, whoever's editing this, we're going to rattle through some EPK questions that were sent over to us. I think like the writing process was just constantly blowing it up and then refining it. And we would kind of throw a lot of things at the wall. Some people think it's, it feels very random, but it's actually what we, we think it's actually at the core of the movie. But we'd throw things at the wall and then try to just hone it back down into something that was specific to this family and really specific to Evelyn and her journey. Every time I do a film, my reason for doing that film is not, not just a great script, but also good storytellers. I was lucky because I had met the Daniels beforehand, and so I had a very um, brief understanding of how their weird brains work. It's still on your bald spot. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> And so I feel like I was at a bit of an advantage because I could hear their sense of humor and their love for beautiful weirdness in the script. What? <laughs> <laughs> I asked them, where did this craziness come from? How did you come to think of all these things? And inside the script, there was this scene with the hot dog fingers, I swear. I had it in the back of my mind. This is getting cut out. There's no way. I don't. I don't. I can't even begin to understand how to do this. Mm. Uh, what? Hot dog. Oh, no! oh, 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 oh my god! <laughs> my fingers. And also, I think at the heart of this story, it's yeah. it's yeah. about chaos. That's the actual villain of this movie. It's not uh, you know Jobu Tupaki or Deirdre or, or anything. It's the chaos itself. And so, we really had to push that as far as we could in order for the story to actually work because it's about a family trying to um, find each other through the noise and chaos. Daniels have been talking about it for a pretty long time. I think originally it was called Bubbles at one point. Hey, Dan. What's up? <laughs> and if you go into their workspace, they have a giant wall of notes and I think there's a chalkboard and descriptions and you could start seeing this thing being like, kind of brewing of act one and act two and these crazy little bubbles and details like fanny pack, raccoon, like you could see all these things and you're like, what is that? And you're like, oh, it's something. And then we, they kind of slowly started talking about like the intricacies of it. What's up? <laughs> Not much. Yeah, it's just okay now. How do we, you know, how do we universe jump? What is that? And they had to describe to me how people were able to get their powers. and. I've worked with them on another feature called Swiss Army Man, and they had been working on this script for quite a while, and by the time I realized it was ready, I was like, all right, let's dive deep. So, did the breakdown, had a buttload of questions, <laughs> and none of it made sense, but I was on already. <laughs> Looks like he's humping your head there. <laughs> it's an added feature. <laughs> So leading up to this, there weren't a lot of specific conversations about what this was going to be other than it's going to, you know, there are going to be a lot of stunts, a lot of special effects, but, but not a lot. Really, the first time I read the script was when I learned what we were going to make. The most important thing about having this film family, I think, is the shorthand. So Daniel's obviously, you know, if we have 
$10 million or we have $400 million, they're gonna squeeze it, jam pack it with everything that they can throw at it. So with all these people, we just built a shorthand so fast with them that when we were shooting this movie, it was very easy for us to just say, all right, don't worry about that. We're gonna do this. And that, that only comes when you're really close with your core team. And I think specifically with Larkin and Jason, our DP and our production designer, we could throw things at them last minute and they're down to kind of figure it out because they're problem solvers. They like jumping in to the deep end. I love to shot list. It's my Zen garden. So everything we have to shoot today. Oh my gosh, it's a lot of shots. <laughs> We're probably not gonna make our day. <laughs> Don't tell the Bonds company. And so I'll go away for a second while, while Shiner goes and takes care of more important things. And I'll just do a really rough pass of a scene um, and then I'll share it with Shiner and we'll throw it back and forth and refine it. And then the last step is we bring it to Lark and Seipel, our, our amazing DP who we've been working with for you know over 10 years, who, who basically can look at a shot list and like guess sometimes what we're going for just because he's in our, our brain and, and he's kind of in the middle of this Daniels collaboration in a way that um, you know can only come with time. It's nice to, to kind of create a set of rules, if you will, or sometimes just like an agenda of what you don't want the film to be like, too, or how to separate things into places as opposed to what you want something to be. It's more of like, what does this universe not have? And so we just kind of start breaking it down between what universe would be supplemented best, like what aspect ratio, or what color made the most sense, or like, how do we ground the real world so that when they go into like a universe where things are different, it visually feels different. So we knew that one of the goals of the movie was to eventually overwhelm the audience, but not too soon. And one of the tools right from the early stages of writing that we knew we would play with is using genre and every filmmaking tool we could to delineate the universes. I have to say this was one of the most difficult scripts to sort of fully comprehend, to also break down because the continuity wasn't a traditional script where scene one through five is day one, scene five through 10 is day two. It, it was all over the place, you know? And so I knew in their minds, everything made sense in the scripts. But like, for me, I was still kind of confused, like, okay, well, you know, what universe is this part? And like, Ready? when does Jovu change? Because within scenes, she will change like five times. Jovu is infinite, is everywhere and nowhere all at once. And Jobu is whatever Shirley Carrado wants me to wear. Similar to other departments, we worked with Shirley to try to create as much range as possible and make it as mundane, but memorable as possible. And then just what kind of, a really open assignment was given to her of like what kind of far reaches can we get to with Michelle and Jobu as they go further and further out. We designed the way she looked. We had the, the you know, she's someone who has no time to take care of herself because she is constantly taking care of her family, uh, her business, and trying to make things work because otherwise she will be perceived as a failure. She had so many costumes and I showed up with what I thought like would be great for her Evelyn character. But I also had just like crazy things like, here's a pizza hat, you know, for your sign spinning costume. And the whole time prior to that, I was like, I hope she's not gonna hate me because some of these costumes are so crazy and not glamorous. And when she walked in, she was like, okay, what do I have to try on? And I was like, well, I thought this would be great. And she's like, yes, I, you know, like for Evelyn's costume, she's like, this is perfect. Yeah, I totally, I, I totally love this. Her style is so playful yet curated. Yeah, so we were like, oh my gosh, she's perfect for the flights of fancy and for Jobu, but we weren't sure about the base layer storytelling, like if that would interest Shirley. And we were so happy when we met her and she started talking about how much she loves finding things in Chinatown and how much she loves Boomer chic. We said, okay, she can't be po polished. She has to be real. So no makeup. In fact, the makeup was added on to make the character older because she's frazzled. Something is off. Your clothes never wear as well the next day. Your hair never falls in quite the same way. A pet peeve of mine is when a character who wouldn't wear tons of makeup and would have stray hairs gets really cleaned up in a movie and it, and it actually like hurts the story to make a character who would be frazzled look nice. And so the important thing is to make sure the actors are on board with that and make sure the department heads are on board with that. 
with Michelle's character and her hero look, like we've seen her in so many different beautiful looks. So this was the hardest, I think, oh, of the for film. For sure, this was the most <laughs> difficult look. Out of all of the crazy looks, I think Michelle was the most difficult because she's supposed to look like the worst version of herself. And she's such a beautiful woman. And it was terrifying <laughs> to like put her in a makeup where she doesn't look gorgeous. It was very scary to be the directors to basically make the beautiful Michelle Yeoh look like an everyday person. <laughs> yeah. Michelle Yeoh's assistant, her wonderful assistant Kit, when she first... She was very upset on yeah. day one. She was like, you cannot make Michelle look like this. Even when we did her wig fitting, I had talked with the Daniels and like, we definitely want to add gray in her hair. And I was like, okay, well, how much is too much gray? So I kind of test the waters with her and she was like, that's too much. Or like she did, this is too, so I'd like weave in some darker color to transition it or make it a little bit more dimensional. And then we found like a happy medium. The first time I saw some of the images, it's scary. It's like, oh my God, did we take it too far? Because I still see myself, right? Because I'm just seeing like snippets of it. Then you step back and you go, good because I don't see me. I see Evelyn Wang, and this is how she should be. Of course, she didn't look as glamorous, and that's just something that translated off the back of this script. Like, as soon as you read it, you're like, great, this woman's life is chaotic. She is not gonna have a blowout. She is not gonna have red lipstick on. Okay, okay, okay! I'm, I'm back! I was so excited on day one. I was like, Kit, you are wrong. This is what, mm -hmm. this is what Evelyn looks like. It's so exciting. Every single follicle is hand placed. Yeah. I love the Daniels so much <laughs> that I'm doing this for them. No, it's gonna it's gonna look really cool. One of the biggest challenges with designing these looks overall was keeping their individuality, no matter what universe we were in. My favorite Jobu costume was definitely the Bagel universe, just because it's kind of a mix of like cult leaders meets like sci-fi. It was sort of open to interpretation and um, I think the only direction I really got from the Daniels is like well we want the set to be all white. You know we all had the the same challenge where almost every other scene is a different color palette, a different LUT with with camera, everything was changing all the time and to be honest it moved so quickly that there wasn't a lot of time to really sit down at a big round table and flesh out things so it was a lot of very quick communication so whether it be you know the a big old temple universe like we knew that joy jobu was going to have this kind of like celestial goddess vibe and then we're you know but we still want to see her skin we still want to see her face we still want to see the shape of her head her you know body i kind of love the idea of mixing something a little bit historical, you know, in the rough that she wore, but then using, you know, a little bit more futuristic fabrics. I think originally we even might have had like separate ideas until we saw the actual costume and the different textures and colors that Shirley was going to use for this specific look. And that's where everything would change. We're like, okay, great. What else could we recollect that would fit this vibe and fit this world? When um, Anissa just did the, the bagel shaped hairstyle like and you know with all the pearls on the, you know for her makeup matching the pearls that's on her wardrobe it just all came together and it just felt like so right the bagel verse is like some of the most beautiful hair design and the the just like the pearls on Jobu's face like did everything for me like all the, all the close ups at the end we shifted the lighting to kind of bring out the pearls and kind of give it like a and even when we were grading it kind of create a pearly effect on the skin there were so many looks, but a lot of it was dictated because we had to work quickly because our shooting schedule was just insane. So a lot of them were like things for me, it was like pops of color or like things that could be done super quickly that would read really well on camera that were quick. And the Jobu pop star look is, is probably my favorite look where they actually spelled Jobu with her hair onto her forehead. And that kind of changed how we lit the scene because we, we wanted to, to kind of just basically show off like top light all the work that they had done and how to highlight that outfit. So the, a lot of the atrium sequence was top lit from then on and kind of pulsing almost like a rock venue. They all happen so quickly that it's, I think that Jobu is like a, it's almost like a flourish of cards where 
it, now we never really stick with one jobu for a really, really long time. It's sort of just like, brrrr. So. So we did a flashback. It's her Elvis wow. look. Salsa. Are you all the secrets? Luchador. Golf oh girl. Gosh. That's what we're doing today. That's her Alphaverse. Alphaverse. <laughs> That's her fat suit look. <laughs> Um, the final sequence, Jobu look, hodgepodge, and normal joy, wow. normal beautiful joy. Honestly, what was so wonderful about all of the actors and actresses we worked with on this film was once they signed on, they knew that they were kind of jumping into the deep end and the, they trusted us and trusted the process. That being said, you know, each of them, you know, had a lot of opinions on, on how they should look in all the different universes. Maybe none more than Jamie Lee Curtis. I think Jamie was really drawn to this part specifically because she was excited to look different and feel different. Oh, oh God! <laughs> no! It's my job to just be her. So as far as I understood her, I understood my part in the movie. I didn't have to understand the movie to understand her, if that makes sense. That was your idea, right? Well, I think it was just that. Like, put it on a watch. It's organic. Yeah. You put it on the right way, though. She picked out that outfit. She even picked out a perfume that she thinks the character Deirdre would wear. Like, every, even all the props that she has in her office cubicle, she brought in a little bag. You don't get one of these unless you've seen a lot of bullshit. Excuse my French. She, to kind of just populate it with, with her own imagining of what this character would be. Jamie Lee Curtis didn't have as many costume changes, but she did show me a costume that she wore years ago where she's wearing these like high rise stirrup pants and she kind of showed her belly. And she's like, I like that. You know, I, I would like the costume to be something like that where she could just let everything go. Another way we approach filmmaking is we kind of encourage the actors to form a relationship with the costumers, the hairstylists, and the makeup team, and and to just follow their impulses to create a look that feels right to them. And so I think there, there were a lot of conversations that went on that we weren't even a part of to make sure that each actor felt comfortable with their look by the time they showed up on set. For me, this process has just been that, uh, you know, kind of, the, the Daniels are very good at bringing in collaborators who are also really creative people on their own. So that happened a lot on this where there was sometimes very minimal interaction where people would look over and say, that's what you're doing. And I, I think there wasn't even a conversation a lot of times that, you know, hair, makeup, wardrobe would see what we were doing. We would see what they were, they were doing because we're in a, a, a small space and just riff off of each other. With a movie like this that has so much ambition and so many different ways it could go wrong, it was really lovely to have all of these department heads that um, really trusted us and not only trusted us, but also saw the movie as an inv invitation to reveal the strangest parts of them. And so every department head would take this film and, and basically fill it with their own strangeness and the wonderful thing about this story is it's a vessel that could hold all of that here we are behind the scenes on everything everywhere all at once we're picking out rocks we got jason we got dan we're picking out rocks all right great thanks for buying the blu-ray we like to make it a very fun environment when we're on set oh Good. yeah oh, out like this ah, see, like that so when you have a family, it's close-knit. You can do things that you can't otherwise do when it's a bunch of strangers because it's very intimate when you're working together. <laughs> See what happens when you don't do a good job? You get punched Jeez. by the director. I must have missed that moment. <laughs> I have to. Slap. It was a slap. They hit us. It was Dolly, I'm for you, gang. <laughs> hit you with good notes. And we would do these warm-ups in the morning, and when you have a film family and these friends, you're able to do dumb things and have fun and make it feel like a summer camp. Here we are, behind the scenes on Everything Everywhere, just doing a little color grade sesh. Yeah. Sorry, keep going. Okay, we, we can go inside. <laughs> yeah, what do you think? You think it's a good idea? It's a great idea. That's our cinematographer. He's, he's got it. He's got it under control. Okay, see you next time, Blu-ray fans. And I think from the very beginning, whenever you're making something with them, you're not making something for them, you're making it 
the guys are saying, with them. And so when, when you're working on their projects, it's not like it's theirs and you're helping them. It feels much more like a, a group is trying to accomplish something. I was wondering, guys, which left do you want to go with for the, uh, for the hot dog scene? I mean, I'm liking the pink. And so you get to see all of our different department heads in different ways put their personality into this film, which is why it has such a specific idiosyncratic mix of of tones and genres. And, you know, it was, it was up to us to make sure that it all somehow maintained a balance. Hey guys, quick question about start working on Jobu Pinata and wanted to make sure the candy drop mechanism is good. Uh, there's basically a pin in the back that can be pulled out with fishing line. And we'll show you what that looks like dropping the candy. One, two, three. Uh, let me know if that would work. Filmmaking jazz is, is a wonderful way to describe exactly what was happening. So, it's so smooth. It's yes. on rollers? What it's it? on rollers and there are people over here pulling it on cables. That, that's exactly what it was. People would take solos and you know, jam apart and riff on it and look over to the next person. They'd pick up where that person left off and bring their part into it. But but it really did feel like that, where it was just, a, it was a very smooth but fast moving machine. Just ask them what we're doing. I'm not going to do it. You should ask someone else okay. to explain the scene. Yeah, I mean, we've only got like 16 more setups to do in the next hour, so like we figured we'd come over and talk to the BTS because it was a good use of our time. You know, this only costs like $300, $300 this conversation. <laughs> we knew we had to find one location for this film. That was the only way it was going to get made because it's, there's too much going on for us to even consider moving production to a different location. We actually had scouted this building, which used to be an old mortgage lending firm that closed down in our previous recession. But it was still kind of just open, and I think I had done a commercial or two there, and people had shot there because the atrium is kind of silly. It's kind of vintage. Most of our scenes take place at this IRS office, so the thought was, let's find a business park or an abandoned office building that we could shoot all of our IRS scenes at and maybe a bunch of other stuff. And we scouted it, and at first we thought it was too big and too intimidating and that we weren't going to be able to pull it off. And then we started looking at a ton of other buildings around, and then by the end of it, like a month later, we were like, I think that's our only option. And then we had to get Jason Casvardi, our production designer, on board, because it was a tall order for Jason to be like, we need you to cover 300 cubicles and make them look like people work here. <laughs> he used um, resolution as his theme for his production design in terms of quality and how you can let it fall off and it still looks great in camera. So a good example of exactly what you're talking about where the quality of the world we're building is decreasing the further away from camera it is, is again in the IRS building. It was, you know, you would see hundreds of cubicles and the five or six in the immediate foreground might have real computers with monitors that turned on and had graphics. And then the 20 beyond that might have some dressing with monitors with cardboard cutouts of printed graphics that we pasted on the computers and they never turned on at all. And the layer behind that was just black cutouts of foam core that we would tape in the corners of the cubicle and even bulletin boards uh, that were just printouts that we stuck on the walls in the deep background. But the location is that the only way we could make it was because we could build and do different sets all throughout the building. It was our little film studio. So we had our main atrium area where Deirdre's desk is, where the bagel shows up in the big climax. We have all this stuff in this main atrium. But then off of there, there's like wings where the executive office was. We had the cafeteria where we built the Wong family apartment. My, probably my favorite set in the whole piece, and that's like that really fun opening shot that pushes through the mirror. I was really excited to do a low ceiling in there, which you don't see on a lot of built sets because they're difficult to light. You, you know, you can't remove the roof panels easily without immediately seeing there's a roof panel missing to, to blast light through it. But it was something I was excited about, and Larkin was happy to work with within those confines and light that set, you know, where we could still see that popcorn ceiling. But one of the things we got to do is we got to just say, all right, there's no trailers outside. We just have these 
these corporate offices, and each one of these offices are going to be where the cast hangs out. So when when they weren't needed on set, usually everyone would just hang out on set by monitors. So we had a very fun monitor culture. And more importantly, when we didn't make our day or if we missed a shot, we could then send B camera running across and go shoot a pickup of you know Evelyn putting on her shoes in the wrong feet or like an insert on a sticky note. A lot of a lot of the shoot eventually just became picking up shots. Early on we knew this movie was going to be a roller coaster ride through genre and one of the benefits of that is every audience member has a built-in understanding of, of genre language even if they can't articulate it. So when they see a certain aspect ratio and certain color treatments, you automatically know, oh, we're in a romance or oh, we're in a sci-fi film. And so we worked really hard with Larkin and our colorist, Alex Bickle. And early on before we even started shooting, basically they started testing out all these different looks and different film grains and different lenses to kind of recreate so many of the films that we loved or at least imitate so many of the films that we loved in a way that was distinct and yet still artful. We had actually looked at a couple of references of intercutting between different worlds or different aspect ratios and how jarring that can be and we ended up loving it. They liked the idea that no matter what happened you still kind of followed the story even if the visuals were kind of actively fighting against you to some degree by going from like 4.3 to anamorphic, then back to 16.9. No, I was, it was, it was really exciting to, to be able to like have a great idea for one universe and I'm like, okay, was that the right universe? Did we, did I, did I burn it there? Should we save it for a different universe? I think like early on we knew we wanted to differentiate the universes using different film languages, but it was through talking with Larkin and prepping the movie that we start to lean more heavily into our favorite films as opposed to kind of what could have been more spoofy. It's the idea, not normal, it's the it's the idea that you can isolate it. Mm -hmm. So so when we're grading it, we can warm it up or shift it more yellow or golden or we can play around with it. We know the strengths of our collaborators and so Daniels actually wrote the movie to bolster the strengths of our collaborators. So think about Larkin, you know, he is a film buff, but he also knows toys. He's so well equipped with just cameras, lights, how to do these things practically, that he would he really loved the challenge of thinking, all right, let's let's play with frame rates, let's play with different color schemes, let's set a really cool look with our colorist so that we can really say that's the red universe, this one's green, this one's white, and we can really build out this look. Can't quite remember how many universes we had, but there were some that were, you know, felt like they were just two shots, like the Ode to 2001 with the hot dog finger monkeys. That was a universe that literally, I believe, is three shots. You know, it's a wide, a medium, and a close. And we had to get a special set of lenses that were like really messed up and were barely able to focus them. Miss Joy! Miss Joy! Larkin? As filmmakers, we're always looking for new challenges. And so it was kind of fun for us to be like, could we try to imitate Carol? Could we try to imitate Wong Kar Wai? Could we try to imitate, you know, all of our favorite films like The, the Matrix or, or even Star Wars? Like mm -hmm. what, in some ways, this was like a fun exercise for us as filmmakers, as, as students of film. We got to really play in other filmmakers' styles, which was just so, so fun for us. All right, guys, loop me in! <laughs> Like the main universe had actually the most lenses because we required the most out of the camera. We had to have anamorphics for the action sequences and then like anamorphics that didn't distort so you could shoot wide shots in close places. Then we had to have spherical to shoot height speed of it. It was, it was a mix of everything. There were conversations about whether or not we wanted to use every single camera just so that we could say that in press. Mm. And my biggest regret is uh, not shooting the rock scene in IMAX. And so we just kind of started breaking it down between what universe would be supplemented best of like what aspect ratio or what color made the most sense or like how do we ground the real world so that when they go into like a universe where things are different it visually feels different. But you know playing with all these film formats but not only thinking about the formats, the scope, but also the colors and the themes and then the grain and the frame rates and all that stuff and how to tell the story cohesively and know when, as a viewer, I don't think many people could think back and say, oh right, it expanded, the, the bars expanded and the screen opened up in these moments, but we feel it subconsciously. Your movie in one word. Uh, uh, that's two words. One word, excess. 
this film, the, the options editorially were pretty much limitless. And I don't, I don't mean that in terms of narratively, but stylistically, you know, and, and somewhat narratively, they were very open and experimental in the way that they were approaching this, which allowed me to be just as open and experimental. He's one of the first editors we've ever worked with who could truly surprise us in a way that was like um, exciting um, because we're so opinionated about editing, it, you know, to find someone who can, can um, surprise us and, and sometimes outdo us is, is such a gift. They have it all, they've written it, they're directors and editors, they're in their head, they know exactly what they want and need and yet allow you to play. <laughs> We're gonna have to open up the edit, you know? We gotta figure out how to use all that. The real challenge of editing this movie is that Daniels wrote it for an intense edit and oh, really? shot it for a very intense edit. <laughs> it was a massive feat to get to edit that film. At the same time, it's all in the script for the most part. A lot of these shots, you think about it, it whips in and whips out. So you're turning, an actor's gonna turn out and the camera's gonna go this way and then the next moment you're back in. You can't really edit around that, right? So. There's a part of it that Daniels really had it in their heads. Three, two, one, go! Ready and go! But even while we were shooting it, there are many scenes where I'm confused, specifically towards the end when Jobu is jumping between universes and she's in the laundromat and she's in the bagel verse, but they're in the rock universe and. You're just talking to the Daniels, being like, where are they looking? And they're like, she's gonna look left, and then Jobu in the other verse is looking right, and then when we cut back, they're both in the rock universe. And you're like, okay, so just tell me which way you want them to look, and I'm gonna pretend that, you, that <laughs> I understand what you're saying. Hey, y'all, welcome to Behind the Scenes on Everything Everywhere All at Once, having a ton of fun here, wearing our masks. Oh, man, all the fans wanna know, uh, what was our favorite part of editing? What do you think, Paul? Oh, I'm <laughs> uh, we're busy. His fair part was how we didn't have time. A lot of the way that we made the movie work uh, when we're cross-cutting between universes and, and trying to blend all these scenes together without it without the audience feeling lost is just was just experimentation and using our intuition of when when it was overwhelming, when it was too much. Between the three of us, it, it really was just this really super collaborative process where we were just passing around projects constantly taking turns with different scenes having this dis having discussions and and giving each other notes and sometimes just saying you know forget it I, I don't I, I want to play with this now give it to me so I can I can I can test some stuff out the freedom was was like there just approach this as if it's it doesn't you don't have to approach it as if this is a movie and it needs to operate in a certain way and it needs to be structured in a certain way we can just throw all that out and, and treat this as its own unique entity and build it as if we're building it from the ground up without any kind of filmic foundation, you know? And that was really, really exciting. And also, we're, you know, scary. We have to thread a very specific needle. Like, if the hot dog hands don't pay off and it pulls people out of the movie, or some of the fight scenes with the butt plugs, like, that pulls people out of the movie. And go! <laughs> then we fail. But if it allows people to let go of their inhibitions, let go of their preconceived notions of what a movie should be, and that lets them fall further into the movie, then we succeeded. I approached the action stuff with just pure excitement and love, and that was the first thing I ever cut was the fanny pack fight. It was, I was so excited to cut it. <laughs> when I auditioned for this role, they asked me specifically, do you have any martial arts background? And I said, yes, I have a black belt in Taekwondo. And as you know, Taekwondo uses a lot of punches and kicks. But guess what? The fanny pack 
uses none of that. You know, it's very Bruce Lee-like, you know, nunchucks and all of that. And I was so excited to show it to them. And then they showed it to the, the crew and the cast, uh, like the day after I finished it, just to, just to show the, how well it was working. <laughs> And I just thought, I mean, it was incredible. And we're so lucky that Paul is a smart, intuitive, and patient editor, because we had to spend about a year honing just how chaotic to make it and, and, and how far can we push certain scenes. But a lot of it was how far can we pull back certain scenes and, and keep the audience on the train tracks. That involved a lot of little test screenings and a lot of late nights kind of discussing, you know, this scene feels good, but in the context of the movie, I think it's pushing people off the train tracks, and I want you to be enjoying yourself until we want you off those train tracks. And it's funny because while we were shooting the movie, the Daniels kept saying, guys, don't forget, we're shooting a family drama. This is a family drama. I am I think the beauty of this is in all that chaos and all the things that is going on, in every universe, it talks about the family. I think one of the things we really wanted to make sure of was that the family story never got washed out by the big cosmic sci-fi action movie. The balance between that core family story and the emotional story of the film and the just like bombasticness stylistically of everything else and the insanity of the different multiverses was what we spent most of our time figuring out in the edit. It was always there. I mean, I, re I remember from the first rough cut, we realized that we had that, that family emotional story and it was hitting and people were, were feeling it. The Daniels have a very uncanny ability to make very beautiful, heartfelt, dumb, sweet things that are funny, hilarious, grotesque, and also have so much heart. Even in a stupid, stupid universe where we have hot dogs for fingers, we get very good with our feet. I mean, there's been several moments where I'm reading reviews or I'm talking to Daniels or talking to Key and Michelle, and we just, like, it's so emotional. We're all like, we're like all constantly crying because it's a pretty, it just feels like this very, very special moment that we're in. What the fuck are you doing? It's been so incredible watching audiences watch this movie and just fully let themselves get taken up and swept away by this experience. And by the end, you know, for the ones who really connect with the film, to see themselves in, in this movie in ways that even we couldn't have predicted. It's, yeah. it's been really cathartic and fulfilling. And it's everything that we want out of uh, the filmmaking process. It's been a torture. I mean, these guys are awful. I mean, they're constantly fighting. They're constantly, like, they're giving contradictory notes. I mean, you don't know what the hell is going on, you know? They're constantly, always, like, hitting each other with dildos, yelling at each other, throwing bagels at each other, hot dogs at each other. In fact, I think it got James Hong so fed up, gong gong, I should say. He got in his wheelchair sped down the hallway and accidentally hit Joe Butabaki. And the production was shut down. Paramedics was called. I mean, it was just crazy. Mrs. Deirdre, I mean, she got so frustrated. She took her frustration out on me. She lifted me up and wanted to crack my back. I mean, that was how crazy it was. But, wait. I think that was a different universe. I don't know. I don't know. See, that's what happens when you let the Daniels fuck with your brains, you know.